All right, I wanna ask you a question. Do you like tests? Now, most of us know that, that you know, the knee-jerk reaction is, I absolutely hate tests, but I don't think that's true. Well, it's true if you're like a 12-year-old Jared trying to do the presidential fitness test for pull-ups. I'm not gonna tell you how many I got, but it might rhyme with Biro. So that's embarrassing, right, in front of you, but I think most of us like tests. Why do you think Facebook is filled with all these things that say like only one-tenth of one percent of people can pass this test? Like, really? Do you think the most intelligent people around the world are studying quantum physics? They're like, hold on a second here. I'm just trying to figure out which cup fills first. No, but we like tests we could pass. I think a bigger question in our whole life is, does God send us trials? Does God send us tests? And if so, why? Well, I think we know the why. If you read in the book of Romans, and it's an often quoted passage, but it says, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his eternal purpose. So what's God's eternal purpose? While we're on this earth, God has this desire that we fear, love, and trust him above all things. God has this desire that we grow in the fruit of the spirit as it talks about in Galatians. Love and joy and kindness and goodness. Here's the deal. We don't start that way. Like when you get a new car, if you've ever had a new car, the worst thing you can do is just mess it up. It starts perfect. It smells nice. It's really good. It, it doesn't get better. Like if you pull on a brand new carpeting in your house, it doesn't become more perseverant. It doesn't become more kind. But as human beings, do you find it interesting that when God describes us, he says we're like infants. We're infants. We don't start out as an infant mature. Instead, this takes time and it takes tests and it takes challenges. So one of the things that God does for us in a lot of ways because we're spiritually like infants is he allows things to happen into our life because the person we are now is not the person that God wants us to be in the future. For his eternal purposes, God says, I want you to be an instrument in this world. And right now you're here, but I'm gonna allow some things so that you can move from the person that needs to be carried to the one that can do the carrying. This week, we're gonna be talking about the trials that God sends into our life and what are some of those reasons that God sends those into our life so that we can go from here to here. Let's pray. Lord, so many of us and our friends are in the middle of a test. Uh, we've endured tests our life that seem pointless, yet things that work according to your purposes, we know make sense. And with that, it might help us this week to focus on our purposes for your tests and how these trials that we're struggling with right now can lead us to a place where we're closer to you. We ask this in your holy name, amen. My grandfather is not alive anymore, but he grew up in South Dakota. He was on his same family farm just outside of Watertown, South Dakota. And sometimes I would be able to sit on his lap. He had just monstrous strong hands from farming. And he would ask me, what's the most valuable thing you have? And I thought this was, I'd be going through like my baseball cars and things like that. And he goes, the most valuable thing you have is your reputation. And I think a lot of us would say we've worked so hard to keep our reputation where it should be, where people think of us. But I think something's really interesting that John Wooden, a very famous coach of UCLA basketball, I think something my grandpa would agree with. This is how he said it. Be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are while your reputation is merely what others think you are. And I think when we think about the things that we've run into, how many of us have been burned by someone who we thought was someone different? We thought that they loved us. We thought they had our best interests in mind. We thought that they could keep a secret. And in the end, they disappointed us. Well, we get some insight into understanding character and reputation from the story of Joseph. I'm sure you know the story of Joseph. If you don't, you can look in the book of Genesis. But we also get insight from it in Psalms. This is Psalm chapter 105. Psalm 105, 17 and 19, it says, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, they bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. The Lord tested Joseph's character. The word in that passage when they talk about testing is the same word they use for metallurgy. And metallurgy is this uh, practice that they use like silversmiths when they apply heat to something so that they can purify it. They apply the heat so they can separate the pure silver from the dross. Now, what does that mean for our life? Right now, you might be in the middle of a test and it might feel like the heat is coming all around you, but what is the purpose of purifying silver? It's purifying it so it could be used for greater purpose. We've got a big word that comes up in the Bible called sanctification. And all that means is set apart for special use. So I know the heat might be coming on you right now and you're saying, God, I can only take so much. But is it possible? that our God is sending this kind of heat and this kind of trial in your life because he has a bigger thing in mind just for you, that he has more lives to be impacted because of you, and there's just a little bit part of your character that needs to be burned out 
so that you can truly be humble and kind and gentle as you work with the people in this world. Let's pray. Lord, tests can be so hard and the heat so intense. Uh, many times we don't feel ready and we feel like we're going to break, but no doubt Joseph felt that same way again and again as he was tested for 13 years. But we trust the finest of your hand, that you are the greatest silversmith working in our lives and you're going to make us the person that we need to be so that we can be your servant and we can do those good works that you set in advance for us to do. We ask this always in Jesus' name, our true Redeemer. Amen. How far are you willing to go for your Christian faith? How far will you push it for the sake of Christ? So just recently I was watching again the call for the U.S. Olympics first gold medal in cross-country skiing. I think it's the greatest call in all of sports. I've watched it literally 15 times and if you know what I'm talking about, Jesse Diggins is making the play to go for the gold medal and if you've seen it, you can just imagine the guy going, here comes Diggins, here comes, I'm getting excited right now thinking about it. So you just have to Google it after this. But it is so exciting as she crosses the finish line and a lot of times we think, oh, if they're an elite athlete, the only way they can do that is because of their natural gifts. They just can process things better than we have. They're just stronger than we have. And the things that they study for these kind of endurance athletes is the way that they process lactic acid. Now this gets kind of technical, but they do tests. They actually take like plugs from their muscles to see how it does. But lactic acid is the thing that makes it so your muscle cannot perform at optimum level. Well, they did a study, and I think it was at uh, CU, Colorado University, Colorado uh, University in Boulder, and they checked their cross country runners. Now, I know this is getting a little bit long, but they tested their cross-country runners, and you would think the very best of their cross-country runners would naturally process this lactic acid way better than the ones at the bottom. However, that was mostly true, except their very best runner, according to tests, would have been at the bottom. So what does that mean? It means that naturally he was not the best. Instead, he just had an ability to suffer. So I ask you again, how far are you willing to go for your Christian faith? I see the example of the Apostle Paul. He has a long list in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to summarize some of this. But he says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was stoned, shipwrecked, night and day in the open sea, uh, but on journeys, danger rivers and robbers and his own people and the Gentiles in the city and the wilderness is at sea, false brothers, hard struggles, sleepless nights, hungry, thirsty. The list goes on and on and on. And you're like, well, I don't know if I've done that before. But how far are you willing to go? And you might be thinking to yourself, and this is who I want to talk to just for a little bit. You know, I do help out at my church. I do suffer for the sake of Christ. I do volunteer and I do all these things. My question, though, and I think sometimes the real test is not, God, how far are you willing to go? Who are you doing it for? Proverbs 27, 21 said, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested not by what they're willing to do, a person is tested by being praised. And so I think what we take a minute as we talk about the test that God puts in our life and what we're willing to do for him is, God, are we doing this for you? Or am I secretly just doing it for me? And I think I just take a moment to check your motives. As you go out this door and say, God, I want to serve you, let's make sure we're serving the Christ who lived and set us free so that we can serve him regardless of who's watching. Let's pray. Recognition is a powerful drug. We pray that when we think of recognition of our own suffering in us and for us, we think that we can give that recognition all to you and people will see our lives and know it's not about us. Instead, it's about furthering your kingdom so more and more people can know that peace that we know in you. We ask this in your name. Amen. What do you think is the most difficult character trait to develop. When you talk about the, the fruits of the Spirit that Galatians talks about, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, self-control. I left one out. And the NIV uses this word forbearance. It's kind of this big word, but essentially it means patience. To me, patience is the hardest character trait to develop. When you think about kids and they're born and they wake up, they cry. They're hungry, they cry. They want to go to sleep, they cry. Or have you ever been, it's been a while for me, but dad, 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 dad. Dad, I'm like, just a minute. And I want to pretend like I could talk a big game as I teach my kids patience. Patience, young grasshopper. But patience is something that takes a while to develop. I know every two-year-old 
is not as mature as every 10 year old. And I know 10 year olds are not as mature as a 20, well, let's just jump to 40 year olds. 10 year olds are not as mature as 40 year olds and 40 year olds are not as mature as seven year olds. It takes time. You can't just talk about patience and make it happen. Instead, you have to experience delays. This is how God describes himself. This is in 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God has this big picture of why he is so patient. So if a seven-year-old is more patient than you are, and God has infinitely been on this planet and around this universe more than you, how much more infinitely patient is he than any of us? And I think we see that. He promises Abraham he's going to have a son. He doesn't have a son until he's 100. He promises David from his line the Savior's going to come. And what happens? It's a thousand years later. He, Jesus made a promise to his disciples that like any moment the end of the world could come. That was 2,000 years ago. So what does this all tell us? We live in a world of instant gratification and I get frustrated when my Amazon package isn't here a day early and I have to wait two minutes for the person in front of me for in the line or I'm just frustrated because someone didn't respond to an email within 24 hours. God is saying patience. It takes time. As a believer, I think one of the struggles and one of the tests that you may be going through now is you want some answers from God. But God isn't patient and slow as we understand it. Sometimes God is bringing us along so that we can develop that certain character, the hardest one to develop, a patience and waiting on the Lord. Let's pray. God, continue your patience with me and do whatever it takes to mold me into that patient, kind, loving child you want me to be. Amen. Have you ever had a time in your life when you're saying, God, like really, right now, when I first got out of the seminary, I was assigned to start a church outside of Seattle. I was really excited about it. And the, one of the ways that you do that is you make all these contacts and the people in the neighborhood and you knock on doors and you just meet people and you invite them at the time we called it Bible Basics. We wanted to teach them the truths of God so they could know the peace that I know. Super excited about it. My first class, I heard about all my friends around the country who started churches and they had all kinds of people going to their classes. So I was really excited. So I, I scheduled the first one and uh, nobody shows up. I'm like, okay, okay, that's that's all right. You know, it could have been a bad day. And then a couple months later, I you know talked to a bunch of people. They made me promises, and then it, no one shows up again. Third time, I'm getting a little nervous, and I'm thinking I'm supposed to be a guy who starts churches. What's going on in my life? So I, I scheduled the third one. I got all these promises. I was sure people were going to show up, and then you know seven o'clock or whatever time it was rolls around, and nobody nobody's there. And I'm kind of waiting and I'm, I'm saying a prayer and I'm kind of all kinds of questions in my life. And then there's this knock at a door and it's Darren and Susan and then Nick and Jenny and Alexandra come through this door. And I, I couldn't be more excited about finally doing like what I was actually called to do to start this church and share God's word with these people. You know, I think that'd be an awesome story and an inspiring story. Uh, but that didn't actually happen that way. The third time, no one, no one showed up either. And I remember sitting down in my basement and I had a class in my basement. How weird is that? But I had in my basement is a walkout basement and my wife came down and I just said, I need a minute. And I started thinking about a Charles Spurgeon quote and he's a Baptist preacher that was on around a long time ago, but he had a quote that said, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. I don't know what kind of trials you're facing in your life right now. I don't know what kind of struggles you're facing right now, but I think back to those years. I mean, this is 16 years ago. And it still kind of gives me chills thinking about it. Where would my faith have been from a human perspective if everything I did had a human success? And where would my church be if in my mind I thought it was Jared's effort and it was my hard work and my intuition that grew this church to where it was at? Sometimes God, even though you have amazing ability, uses what's happening in your life to humble you. Sometimes God uses your very best skills to humble you. Some guys, God just brings you low. And sometimes he just uses things to push you up against the rock of ages. When we went to start a church again, just outside of Denver, south of Denver, we used a different passage to name that church. And this is the one, it's from Isaiah. It says, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. 
I don't know what kind of trials you're facing right now, but I know that Christ faced even more trials. I know that God went all the way to a cross to assure your salvation. And whatever he is throwing at you, I guarantee it's for your eternal purpose to move you from here to where God wants you to be. So let's pray. God, it's hard to trust. Uh, and it's hard to trust when we're so scared. But you are the eternal rock. You became flesh and blood for our sake. You bring storms, you allow storms, but we know it's all part of your plan. So we pray with the psalmist, do whatever necessary to bring us close to you, our rock eternal. Amen. Hey, what's up everyone? Pastor Mike here from Time of Grace. Thanks so much for checking out this podcast. Uh, we certainly would love this message to reach more and more people. So if you wouldn't mind rating and reviewing this podcast, it would bring it to more people's eyes and we pray this message into more people's hearts. Thanks for your support and we'll talk to you soon.